story of the credit union movement in Vermont begins long before the Association of Vermont Credit Unions was formed. Before the first credit union appeared in Vermont, the movement was spreading across the country by the efforts of Roy Bergengren, a Massachusetts lawyer who would eventually become founder of the Association of Vermont Credit Unions. But first, Roy was tasked by credit union pioneer Edward Filene with pursuing credit union-enabling legislation in Congress and in state houses across the country. He planted the seeds of new credit unions wherever groups of people had interest and formed what we know today as the Credit Union National Association and the CUNA Mutual Insurance Group. Forming a credit union in Vermont first became possible following passage of the Federal Credit Union Act in 1934. One year later, the Burlington Rendering Company Federal Credit Union opened its doors to serve company employees on the shores of Lake Champlain. The Green Mountain's first credit union served the company's employees until its closure in 1963. Vermont credit union development was slow but steady through the 1930s. By the end of the decade, the state's longest continuously operating credit union, Vermont VA Federal Credit Union, had opened its doors in 1939. It was a few years later that Vermont finally got its own credit union law in 1941, when the Vermont legislature wholeheartedly passed H-185 in 1941. But organizing credit unions under state law was soon tempered by World War II. Wartime restrictions severely hampered consumers' ability to save and borrow. So nationwide, the number of credit unions declined from about 9,900 at the start of the Second World War to under 8,700 by its end. The economic boom following World War II benefited credit unions, and their development in Vermont was aided with the arrival of Roy Bergengren. After serving as leader of the national credit union movement since the early 1920s, Bergengren sought to spread the credit union idea throughout the Green Mountains. Under the auspices of the Vermont Cooperative Council, Bergengren traveled, getting new credit unions off the ground. At the same time, Bergengren began organizing an umbrella association to support the state's credit unions. On October 26, 1946, the Vermont Cooperative Council gathered representatives of the 12 existing credit unions to draft plans for more rapid credit union development in the state. Seven months later, on May 24, 1947, the same group met again to officially form the Vermont Credit Union League. Notably, two credit unions currently in existence were chartered that same year, Vermont State Employees Credit Union and White River Credit Union. Six months later, Roy Bergengren was named managing director of the league and, without pay, promoted the growth of Vermont credit unions until retiring for a second time in 1954. He remained influential in retirement, promoting credit union development abroad and the formation of the World Council of Credit Unions in 1954. Bergengren's retirement from the League left a void to be filled temporarily by Robert Rosegrant, succeeded a few months later by his permanent replacement, Francis Butler. Both had previously served as chairman of the League's board. Through 1957, the League had been forming about six credit unions per year with the help of a statewide volunteer network. By this point, Vermont had 65 credit unions with 2.8 million in assets serving 14,000 members. But wide differences in liquidity among the state's credit unions brought about efforts to form the Vermont Central Credit Union. Although the League's charter included the ability to function as a credit union for credit unions, it was decided that a separate entity would be more effective. So at the League's annual meeting in 1958, Vermont Central Credit Union was created. Unlike corporate credit unions of today, Vermont Central served both credit unions and individuals. Credit union officers of the day were unable to obtain loans from their own organizations due to perceived conflicts of interest. Vermont Central filled that role, making $13,000 in loans the first year, and within a decade, increasing that amount to $1 million annually. It soon became an important investment and liquidity resource for Vermont credit unions. Another major initiative begun during Butler's tenure was the creation of the Roy Bergengren Scholarship Fund in memory of the League's first leader. It provided financial aid to credit union volunteers and employees for education, research, or other activities furthering credit union growth and development. In 1959, the League's managing director was made a full-time position. Butler served in that capacity briefly before his passing in 1960. By then, the number of Vermont credit union members had almost doubled and assets of the state's movement were breaking $5.4 million. 
Butler's successor in 1960 was already a leading credit union advocate. Bob Rose Grant had served the movement in a variety of roles and was profoundly committed to credit union ideals. During his time as managing director, the League created a standardized handbook for credit unions, which became essential to their volunteers. Regular updating of the handbook was the role of the League's Volunteer Education Committee. In 1962, the League hosted its first Fall Institute, a day-long program of workshops and presentations providing volunteers and staff with vital training. The annual event became very popular as a primary source of education for Vermont Credit Union volunteers for many years. Bankers of the 60s lobbied for the restriction of credit unions at both the federal and state levels. Vermont bankers responded to a 1962 call by the American Bankers Association to oppose a league-advanced bill in the Vermont State House. Then, in 1965, bankers again lobbied hard against the League's rewrite of Vermont credit union laws, but passage by the legislature was a resounding victory for Vermont credit unions. In 1968, leadership of the League was handed over to Charles Howe. Like Rose Grant, Charlie Howe had extensive credit union experience before becoming managing director. While employed as a state employee, he served as volunteer board chair of the Vermont State Employees Credit Union in the 50s and had been chair of the League's board since 1962. Until 1969, credit union expansion had been driven mainly by chartering new credit unions, whose number peaked nationally at almost 24,000 that year. Meanwhile, Vermont credit union members were on the decline, with 77 in 1969 and 73 in 1982. But membership grew to over 94,000. The movement was transitioning from many smaller credit unions to fewer, larger ones. The 70s also saw legislative developments that, combined with advances in technology, radically changed the way Vermont credit unions conducted business. Banker opposition to credit unions now intensified, especially when the Vermont legislature declared credit unions exempt from sales tax in 1970. And in 1978, bankers were again unsuccessful in seeking a federal tax on credit unions in the face of a nationwide credit union advocacy campaign. But prior bank versus credit union legislative battles paled in comparison to the battle to provide members with share draft accounts in the face of banker opposition. In 1977, the National Credit Union Administration authorized credit unions to enter the checking account arena with share drafts. New England IBM Employees Federal Credit Union was first in Vermont to provide members with share draft accounts, but it was short-lived. Bankers challenged credit unions' right to checking accounts in federal court, and the judge ordered them suspended. In response, Vermont credit unions successfully lobbied for passage of Vermont legislation ensuring share draft privileges for state chartered credit unions. Simultaneously, they participated in a national Save Our Share Drafts grassroots campaign in support of credit union checking accounts. On the heels of over 100,000 member letters to Congress, share drafts were permanently enacted into law by Congress in 1980, the same year that the credit union pioneering share drafts in Vermont installed the state's very first credit union-owned automated teller machine. Following that success, Charlie Howe died unexpectedly in 1982, leaving a much different Vermont credit union movement than what he inherited in 1969. By the end of the decade, the League had added several staff members and in 1980 elected its first female board chair, Wanda Barrow. When Charlie Howe died at the helm of the League at age 72, Joe Bergeron had been his assistant for four years. So the transition went smoothly when the League board named him president of the League one month later in March of 1982. Up to this point, all chief executives of the League had assumed leadership later in life following lengthy careers. But now, at the age of 25, Bergeron became the youngest person ever assuming the presidency of any state credit union league. As Howe's assistant, Bergeron had served as consultant and troubleshooter for credit unions, led several league initiatives, and was Vermont's first delegate to CUNA's National Youth Involvement Board. Given the breadth of his involvement with Howe, Bergeron hit the ground running with ambitious projects in his early years as league president. One immediate project was the relocation of the League's cramped and run-down Montpelier office. Following an extensive search, the League's building committee and board settled on purchase of a building in South Burlington. Starting in 1983, the 1000 Shelburne Road location served as the League's headquarters for the next three decades. 
In addition, the new building afforded space for several new ventures. One of those was DataLine of Vermont, initiated by a committee researching data processing alternatives for joint usage by credit unions. Formed in 1983, DataLine was cooperatively owned by 12 credit unions with administrative support provided by the League. It operated successfully through the 80s. Another major initiative in the new League building was creation of the Vermont Credit Union Center. The center was one of a very few national precursors to today's shared branching network. It provided teller counter functions to members of 14 credit unions from throughout the state. The center, perceived by members as a branch of their credit union, was operated by League staff. The Credit Union Center did brisk business through the 80s, with its usefulness gradually eclipsed by the League's introduction of its ATM debit program in 1990. Initially, the League's Q card program was dependent on partnerships with two large Vermont banks. Upon their exit from the service years later, the League joined with two credit unions and three smaller community banks to form the Falcon Cooperative ATM Network. The arrival of the 90s brought political threats to credit unions, requiring mobilization not seen since the fight over share drafts in the 70s. This time, bankers won a legal challenge to credit union membership, arguing that multiple groups in a credit union's field of membership was contrary to common bond cited in the Federal Credit Union Act. As part of a massive national rally in the nation's capital, the League delivered two busloads of Vermont credit union leaders to join thousands of others on the Mall in Washington, D.C. in support of H.R. 1151 to clarify wording of the Federal Credit Union Act. The credit union campaign for consumer choice successfully convinced Congress to pass H.R. 1151 by a wide margin, keeping the door open for many thousands of credit union members to retain their membership. In 2002, the League again began a long overdue rewrite of Vermont's credit union law to bring it on par with federal law. The effort called for a new level of advocacy, with the League's first full-time lobbying team and public communications campaign. Again, bankers staunchly opposed change to Vermont's credit union law and sought the taxation and restriction of credit unions. Following a two-year hard-fought effort, an updated state credit union law was enacted by Vermont legislators in 2005. In 2003, the League introduced its indirect lending program, allowing members to get credit union car loans without leaving dealer showrooms. Today, 140 Vermont dealers participate, and in aggregate, credit unions capture more car loan business from dealers than anyone else. In 2006, after 59 years under the Vermont Credit Union League moniker, members voted to change their organization's name to Association of Vermont Credit Unions to better reflect its purpose with legislators and the public. Also in 2006, the association entered the international scene with a partnership with Peruvian credit unions. Bergeron led a group of representatives on the initial visit to Peru in 2007, where a partnership agreement was executed. Subsequently, numerous exchange visits were made, and association staff provided aid on Peruvian efforts to develop an ATM network, shared branching, deposit insurance, and even testimony before Peruvian legislators on credit union taxation. The association embarked on new initiatives in financial education when, in 2008, it introduced a nationally acclaimed Certified Credit Union Financial Counselor Program to training credit union employees to provide financial advice for members struggling in difficult situations. The effort received a further boost the following year, when the association received a $137,000 federal grant to develop its Economy of Me High School Financial Literacy Program, which employed the League's first youth financial literacy advocate for presentations to high school audiences throughout the state. By 2012, the program had reached over 8,000 high school students. It was also in 2008 that the association introduced shared branching, allowing members to use branch locations of participating credit unions in all 50 states as if they were in their own credit union location. Starting in 2008, the League began declaring a patronage refund to member credit unions from the surplus earnings of its for-profit services corporation subsidiary, based on each credit union's usage of select League programs. Since inception of the practice, the League has returned approximately $1 million to its members. 
Following 30 years in the same South Burlington location, in 2012, the association relocated to its current office location in Colchester. The former Vermont Credit Union Center was demolished to make way for a new branch office building owned by New England Federal Credit Union. 2014 once again brought a challenge from bankers in the Vermont State House. A commission study argued that credit unions don't provide service to low-income people as well as banks do. It went on to suggest, once again, the taxation of credit unions based on their membership, size, and services, while ignoring their not-for-profit cooperative structure. The League issued a counterpoint report, citing the fallacies of the banker study point by point. Ultimately, legislators weren't swayed by banker rhetoric and made no effort to alter treatment of Vermont credit unions. Keeping in mind the origins of Vermont credit unions were supported by other cooperatives, in 2015, the League hosted a summit of the state's cooperatives, the highlight of which was the first ever League-hosted gubernatorial debate among five candidates running for Vermont's highest elected office. The event was a resounding success, drawing a standing room only crowd and much press coverage. Because of sacrifice and hard work by thousands of volunteers and staff over seven decades, the Association of Vermont Credit Unions and its members have grown from humble beginnings with the Burlington Rendering Company of the 1930s into a cornerstone of the state's economy. The number of credit unions today may be no larger than what it was in 1948, but over one third of them exceed $100 million in assets, and today, 58% of Vermonters are credit union members. The Association of Vermont Credit Unions is proud to celebrate 70 years of helping bring the benefits of cooperative credit unions to all Vermonters. <laughs>